with uh, Ali Rezik in his third talk. Okay, thank you again for the invitation. And uh, I want to apologize from some of uh, colleagues here because it's going to be a variation of a talk that they've heard before. But this is what I've been asked to present. So, um, okay, so the goal today is to present a general setting of affine seed, what it is, and um, what, what, is, what result is known and how one can prove it. So um, let me start with a historical point of view. So as you know well, lot, there are lots of questions in number theory that asks for existence of infinitely many primes in a sequence of one parameter integers. So I give you a family of one parameter integers and then I ask, can you find infinitely many primes in that? So let me start with uh, maybe the birth of analytic number theory, Dirichlet's theorem. So it says that there exists infinitely many x where ax plus b is prime if there is no local abstraction. And that means uh, GCD of A comma B is 1. So for some silly reasons, I prefer to avoid this. And instead of saying this, I can, I can avoid conditioning A and B. But then instead of asking for primes inside Z, I can ask for primes inside Z joint with 1 over the GCD. Okay, It's the same. So either I can put some condition on, on the function, or I can change my ring and ask for primes in some other ring. So another way of writing it is that there exists, alternatively I can say, that there are finitely many ramified primes. I threw them in the denominator, and besides that, there are going to be primes. So alternatively, alternatively, I can say that there exists infinitely many x inside z such that ax plus b ax plus b is a z joint with 1 over gcd of a comma b prime okay so of course if gcd is 1 i am getting back what i have before otherwise i am just saying forget about the primes inside the gcd those are units OK, so this is a beautiful theorem. We have the best understanding that one can hope for. But uh, immediately, if you change this to another polynomial, you, you get into trouble. Um, so the twin prime, twin prime conjecture. It says that, OK, so there exists infinitely many x inside z such that uh, x times x plus 2 has at most two prime factors. So as we change it uh, from degree 1 to degree 2, degree 2 polynomials, then we immediately get into trouble. Or you can think about x squared plus 1, the Euler's conjecture, it's the same. So degree 2 already gets uh, in danger zone. But nevertheless, sieve methods can give us a lot of information. For instance, the, so Brun um, came up with Brun's sieve in order to handle this kind of question. He got, uh, I think, to 29 primes, and then the sieve method got more sophisticated, and uh, Chen proved his nice result <coughs> that uh, there exists infinitely many x, where this guy, OK, maybe not two, two primes, but uh, this guy has at most three primes. So the moral of the story is that if you don't ask for precise number of prime factors, then you might be in luck. Okay, so then 
especially sieve methods, can help you to get the so-called almost primes. Let's look at another uh, historical conjecture, uh, Merson prime conjecture. So it says that there exists infinitely many x, such that 2 to the x minus 1 is prime. So here we are in worse shape than here. Here, even if I relax and ask, do I have infinitely many x such that 2 to the x minus 1 has at most a million number of prime factors? We don't know. Okay, so if you give me any constant number, and then you ask, do I have infinitely many x such that 2 to the x minus 1 has r number of almost, I mean, r number of prime factors, still we don't know. The point is that these are so sparse that sieve methods cannot handle. Okay, so these are very sparse. So, so in this case, here we don't know. if there exists infinitely many x such that 2 to the x minus 1 has at most r prime factors for a fixed r. Okay, more of the story, in some cases, even sieve cannot help us. Even relaxing the number of prime factors uh, does not give us a theorem. Now, the question is, okay, so in these examples, these are single parameter sequence of integers. What happens if I change single parameter to multi-parameter? What should be the right question? Obviously, just asking for infinitely many is not is not very good because I can restrict myself to a curve within that infinitely many and I mean within within that multi-parameter and then ask for infinitely many. So then Burgan, Gambord, and Sarnak suggested that the better notion is the risky density. So of course in a one parameter, infinitely many is the same as the risky density. But when you go to multi-parameter, this is a new notion. So they suggested that you should look, you should look at so Burgen, Gambur, Sarnak. Suggest that, that uh, in multi parameter setting infinitely many should be replaced with the risky density. OK, what, what do I mean? They illustrated with a, with a nice example. They reinterpreted a hardy little wood conjecture in this, in this form. So let me say what it is. <laughs> So what does it say? So it says, uh, let's start with a finitely generated okay, a subgroup of uh, z to the n. It's going to be finitely generated anyway. So and suppose that I give you b, a vector inside z n. And then. I'm going to shift lambda by b, and I ask for lots of points in this shifted subgroup where all the entries are prime. Okay. So alternatively, it's, it's the same as saying, if, so if I think about it like polynomials or functions, so it's the same as saying that I'm considering this function
And then I look at the set of lambda. Okay, so let lambda sub r of f be the following. Those vectors of inside lambda where f sub b <coughs> of lambda has at most r prime factors. So asking if, if all the entries are prime or not, so more or less is about asking if this guy has at most n prime factors. So an, another way of looking at hardy littlewood conjecture is the way that Wolfgang gamur sarnak uh, reinterpreted it is the same as saying that uh, is this guy Zariski dense in the Zariski closure of land. So that's the question. Okay. So they ask, if I look at those guys where the, the product of the entries have at most n prime factors, do I have this? Uh, of course you need if there is no local abstraction. So I mean, a special case of this is when n equals to 1, then uh, lambda you can think about uh, a times z. And then you are shifting it by b. So again, you need a kind of local abstraction. You need, you need a kind of GCD kind of phenomena. So here it's a bit more subtle. Um, so what do I mean by lo local abstraction? So at least for any finitely many primes that I give you, you should be able to uh, to give me some lambda that is co-prime to these guys. Otherwise, there is no hope of getting lots of them. So this is how you formulate no local, local abstraction for every square free Q. You want to show that they, I mean, you demand that there exists some element of lambda such that GCD of this shifted value and Q is 1. Okay, so for every finitely many primes, you want to at least have some lambda whose components are co-prime to this, to these finitely many primes. Otherwise, you cannot ask for such a thing. So under this assumption, hardy little with conjecture can be reformulated in some sense. It, it's not completely equivalent, but uh, yes. Yeah, so I doubt that one can prove this without proving the density one, which is the original hardy little conjecture. I should say that now this conjecture is actually solved if the rank of lambda is at least 2 by um, so green tau, green tau, and sigma. So, uh, they prove the density one, which is better than this. They count. Yeah. Yeah. The density is better than this. Yes. So they they give the case when rank is at least two. Of course, the historical one was for rank equals to one, but yeah. So the two in prime, for instance, is a special case of rank equal to one you're going to take the line. Anyway, so uh, now all of these examples are commutative. Now you ask yourself, can I formulate a setting for a non-commutative groups? So what does that mean? So here is the general setting of a fine C. You start with a finitely generated subgroup say GL and Q. You take a polynomial map, so let me put this N not here, so later on when I use N, it's not this index. So uh, I take a polynomial map on the entries of this. So F is a polynomial map.
polynomial function on the entries of these matrices. Then I ask myself, can I find um, some R, like one in the first example, two in the second example, and in this example, some number of some upper bound for the number of prime factors, and bunch of ramified primes, bunch of uh, local obstructions. That as soon as I avoid these local obstructions, the set of elements inside gamma, where f of gamma has at most r prime factors, is dark, is Zariski dense. So that's the question. Let me write it down. So let me actually use this notation. So can we find r there, r and q naught, such that if I look at the set of r comma q naught of f, and I define this to be this, those those elements of gamma such that f of gamma has at most r z joint with 1 over q naught prime factors such that if I look at this set, this set is supposed to be large such that this is a risky dense in uh, G, which is the Zariski closure of gamma. So under what conditions can I hope for such a thing? So this is the general setting. Of a fine C. So as you can see, a fine sieve is not a new method but rather is a new setting for sieve. So it's a non-commutative multi-parameter setting for sieve. OK, so in this kind of question, we want to ask ourselves, under what setting, under what conditions for gamma, can I hope that for any function f, I would be able to come up with r and q naught where this happens? OK, so it's a, it's a question about gamma in some sense. OK, so le let's reinterpret the examples that we have in, in, this, in these terms. So let's, us let's us start with Dirichlet theorem. In the Dirichlet theorem, because I, I'm looking at matrices, so it's like saying that gamma is actually the cyclic group generated by 1, 1, 0, 1. And then and F is just uh, A times x1, 2 plus B. This gives you the Dirichlet setting. So there, Dirichlet theorem implies that uh, gamma sub 1 comma GCD of A comma B is actually Zariski dense inside the Zariski closure, which is the additive group in this. Okay, so this is Dirichlet's theorem. You see the precise R. This is the best possible R is called the saturation number. In, in any given example, it's extremely hard, hard to find the best one. But here, the question does not ask for the best one. We just want to find some R. <laughs> so for instance, Chen's theorem is the same as saying that the same group, you take the same group, but this time F is x12 times x12 plus 2. And then Chen's theorem says that gamma sub 3 and no, <laughs> and q naught is just 1. There is no ramified prime. Then this is dense. OK, how about Mersenne prime? Mersenne prime conjecture is about this group. So Mersenne prime is, the, is about the cyclic group, but this time it's generated by 2 and a half. And the function is x1, 1 minus 1. OK, 
Okay, so this is the group and this is the function. And here, as, you, as, as I explained, we don't know if, if there is any such R and Q naught. And it's not just the, it seems that it's not just uh, the weakness of the method of sieving. The point is that if I actually ask for such a thing for all the regular functions, for all the polynomial functions f, at least heuristics suggest that uh, most likely it does, it's not true with, for this group. Okay, so there is a conjecture. Okay, maybe I just say heuristics. suggests, even though maybe because it's a very sparse set, a heuristic cannot suggest much. But uh, nevertheless, it does. It suggests that the number of prime factors of 2 to the n minus 1 times 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1 goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. This is the number of prime factors, number of distinct prime factors. So it seems that this phenomena is true, which means if I change my function to x11 one, one minus 1 times x11 one, one minus 2, there is no such r. There is no such q naught. Okay, so, so this means if f for f equals to x11 one, one minus 1 times x11 one, one minus 2, uh, there should not be any R and Q naught for which this is a risky dance inside the multiplicative group. So it seems that it's not uh, because C method doesn't work, if I change my regular function to something, we might, I mean, the statement might fail. And it's not just uh, the, the multiplicative group directly itself. Another, uh, another type of multiplicative group, uh, the so-called anisotropic tori, so another kind of example that you, sh you can think of is this kind of example. That again, uh, heuristics would suggest, and in fact, I think this one is a conjecture. OK, so there is this conjecture that there are infinitely many n where fn, where f is the Fibonacci number, is prime. But then there is another conjecture in the other direction that the number of prime factors of even indices Fibonacci actually goes to infinity. Again, you can think about this like, like, like this one. So you take gamma to be the group generated by 0, 1, 1, 1. And then this guy raised to power n, as probably you've seen before, is the n minus Fibonacci, n Fibonacci, n Fibonacci, n plus 1 Fibonacci. And if you take your function to be traced times fn, or so x sub 1, 2 times x sub 1, 1 plus x sub 2, 2. Then you, when you plug in gamma to the n, you get a <coughs> f to the n. So again, this means that for this function, it seems that there is no such r and q naught, because the number of distinct factors is going to infinity. So you cannot have infinitely many such n's. So you That's right. Uh, if I square, so you mean if I look at 2n, that's correct. Yes, maybe that's better actually. Because then I do not have to take the square root. Okay, so let's do that. <coughs> Good. 
things. So then actually the 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 Zoris key closure is is already connected. So, <laughs> so, then, then, so notice that uh, the closure, the Zoris key closure. So if you look at the Zoris key closure, it's more or less. So it is precisely. Uh, you look at the, you add the golden ratio to Q, and then look at those elements inside this field whose norm is one. Okay, so that would be the Q points of that. So this is this is called the anisotropic chloride, and it is denoted by this. So, so you take the restriction of scalars of the multiplicative group, and then you look at those guys whose reduced norm, whose norm is one. Okay, so. So uh, anyway, so if you don't know it, this, it doesn't matter that much. The point is that a multiplicative group or a fancy multiplicative group, it seems that this kind of a statement, there is no hope for it to be true. Okay. And the point is that it's not just these kind of things. So, so as uh, Peter likes to say, this Taurus is the enemy in this setting. But it's not just a Torah. Eh? The point is that if, as soon as you have a character from your group, as soon as you have a homomorphism from your group to a multiplicative group, then if this multiplicative group has a bad polynomial, you can pull it back and get a bad polynomial for your r 2 prior group. Yes? If I will tell you what we expect, yes. I mean, what we expect, in fact, to what is what we do know is to be true. Uh, that's a theorem. Yeah, I will write it down. <coughs> I'm glad the answer to your question is yes. So, what I just said is that it seems this condition is to be uh, necessary that uh, your G should not have any character but in fact I mean there is a, a very I mean easy soft kind of argument that says um, it's enough to prove it for a Zariski connected group so from this point on I'm gonna assume that my my Zariski closure is actually connected so it seems that uh, this this condition is needed that the which is the homomorphisms from this to the multiplicative group. So without that, again, if I have a character, if there is a bad polynomial on the multiplicative guy, I pull it back and I get a bad polynomial, bad function <coughs> on the guy. <coughs> so this seems that this is needed. And in fact, under this condition, we have a theorem. OK, so here is the theorem. So it says that if, uh, OK, let me start again. <coughs> OK. So your gamma is a finitely generated subgroup of uh, GLN. And uh, G is the Zariski closure. Um, the connected component has no characters. Then for every, so then, for every function. So one thing that I have to say, uh, I, I started with a polynomial function on all tables. But at the end of the day, I'm interested on in the values of this function on gamma, which means I'm restricting f to the Zariski closure of uh, gamma at the end of the day. And that's, that's called regular functions on g. So essentially, I have to look at the regular functions on g. And if my regular function is entirely zero and, and connected component, I don't care. So uh, this means in here, this should be non-zero divisor or yeah, so non-zero divisor. If it's connected, it just means that it's not zero. So then for every such guy, there exists R and Q naught such that I'm going to rewrite that here in order to so such that this is Zariski dance in G. 
where this is paired with that. Those elements of gamma, where f of gamma has at most r z joint with 1 over q naught primes. OK. What Burgan, Gambut, and Sarnak had already proved, and which is more or less most of the work, is the following. They said that in, the, in, in that setting, OK, so they didn't want to deal with this. I mean, they wanted to present uh, the generals in the setting and so on. So they didn't deal with some of the technicalities. So they started with inside Z. And they, instead of localizing, they already assumed that the function f does not have local obstruction. So they carefully defined it what it is. So they assume that it is inside. OK, this is a regular function. They assume that it is absolutely irreducible. And the values of f and gamma is z. And f is primitive. I don't define it. But it's more or less saying that it has no local obstruction. And this is the main distinction between these two statements. And they assume that the action of gamma on the product of GL and ZP has spectral gap. OK, so uh, GL and not ZP. and Z mod PZ. Okay. So assuming that this guy has a spectral gap here, and uh, for these kind of fun regular functions, they show this a statement. OK, so yeah. This is what they show. OK. Now, the first thing that I want to show is um, how one can get such a result using this result. And then next, I'll go into the proof of this. I mean, they prove this, and then they prove a spectral gap in the SL2 case. And as a consequence, they get unconditional statement for when the Zariski closure is SL2. That's actually why they, uh, they prove a spectral gap, not, I mean, they get a spectral gap okay, they, uh, not for prime modulus, but rather for square-free modulus. Because for sieving, they do need a square-free. So that's like saying getting a uniform spectral gap for this, instead of that, they need a spectral gap for the product. So that's the distinction between prime modulus and a square free modulus. Yeah. So that's uh, actually a good part of the article is about that spectral gap for SL2 of orbit, uh, square free modulus. But yeah, so yeah, I'm not, yeah, so today's talk is going to be on the f about the first part of the article, which is the affine C. OK, so uh, let's see how one can get that out of here. Again, as I mentioned, uh, one, can, one can reduce it rather easily. You can reduce to the, to the case uh, where G is connected. So I'm going to assume this. <coughs> And why is it important? Because I want to take the drive, I mean, the derivative of g again and again and again. And I want to say that it will stop. 
um, in, at most in dimension of G steps. The point is that because G is connected, the derivative of G is going to be connected as well. So either it's the same thing or the dimension drops. So this means that at most in dimension of G steps, it will stop. OK, so let's look at this again. So I'm, I'm looking at G, and then I look at the derived subgroup of G, and then again the derivative of the, this guy. And continue like that. And because G is connected, this is going to be connected, this is going to be connected, and so on. So this chain would definitely stop at most in dimension of G steps. And let's call this guy H. And that means that H is actually a perfect group. So and H is a connected group, and the commutator of H is itself. Okay, so I repeat this, this again and again till it actually uh, stops. And you can call this guy the perfect core of G, if you wish. Okay. So we have this kind of uh, sequence. So H is a normal subgroup. And the quotient, and then I have to tell you something about the quotient. So what, what, what do I know about the quotient? The point is that any group G that I give you, any algebraic group G that I give you, if you uh, do not know, you can actually write it as something uh, reductive. So let's call it uh, L, semi-direct product, something that is unipotent. This is unipotent, which means you can upper triangularize it with one on the diagonal. And uh, this guy is reductive, which means you do not have any unipotent normal subgroup. When I tell you that G has no character, it means this reductive guy is actually semi-simple. It has no sense. Okay. So it's, this is, in fact, equivalent. When G is uh, Zariski connected, this is equivalent to say that it's semi-simple. OK, let me actually write it as L. So it is semi-simple, semi-direct product, unipotent. This comes from the condition that it has no character. And now, when I take commutators again and again and again, this is essentially semi-simple, so it, is, it stays like that. So this means this is part of H. So when I mod out by that, I'm going to get a quotient of U, which is a unipotent group. So the image is definitely unipotent. So I will, this, not, this U is not that U, but this is a unipotent guy. This is not necessarily the entire unipotent. So for instance, if I take uh, SLN semi direct product Rn, this is a perfect group itself. So H is uh, the entire G. But nevertheless, you might have unipotent part of it. So this is unipotent, and this is perfect. OK, so it seems that um, we are looking at, OK, so one thing that I have to point out from algebraic group theory, that if whenever you have uh, such a homomorphism, when u is, is unipotent, you can actually have, you do have a section that's defined over q. OK, so there is a section, not group homomorphism, but there is a section, since u is unipotent, is defined over q and is unipotent. There exists a section that's defined over Q, which means not as a group, but as a variety, G can be viewed as product of H and U. Okay. So as a Q variety, you can think about it like that. So it seems, OK, so it, it means that I can view G, I can, I can think about U as base, as my base. And then on top of each point, I have a fiber that's essentially a perfect group. Okay. Now, I'm, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to uh, separate my problem for unipotent and perfect. And if you remember from yesterday, for, for perfect, we do have a spectral gap. Okay, so then I'm going to use Burgan-Gambur-Sarnak method 
to deal with each fiber. But I want to glue these fibers together, so I need a stronger result than this. I need a control on R and Q naught, so that they, un they don't vary much on the fibers. And a stronger result on the, on the base, so that I, be, I would be able to glue these things together. So let's write down what I'm trying to say precisely. So as a variety, as a Q variety, G is isomorphic to H times U. So what does that mean? This means I, I'm given a regular function, F on G. This means that, I mean, the ring of regular functions of G is actually a tensor product of reg, ring, ring of regular functions of these guys. And that means that uh, there exists, so for a given F, there are linearly independent functions, regular functions on Q, uh, on H, and regular functions on U, such that, uh, okay, so under this isomorphism, F actually goes to the sum of pi tilde tensor fi. What does that mean in concrete terms? It means that when I apply it, so if I pick something from gamma and something inside the intersection, so I should have done that. Okay, so I'm going to do it right here and then. So this exact sequence, I'm going to extend it to an exact sequence of gamma as well. So I have this G here. I have H here. One. I have U. I have one. And then gamma is sitting here. I take the intersection of gamma and H. And then I take the quotient by pi. Because gamma is a risky dense here. So as soon as gamma is a risky dense, the derived subgroups are going to be the risky dense. In the derived subgroups of G. And therefore, these guys, are, this is also the risky dense. And pi is an algebraic map, so this is also the risky dense. So that's why we can more or less separate the problems on the perfect part and the unipotent part. So now I take something here and so let's say I take, so let's call it, I take something inside gamma and something inside the intersection. Let's call it gamma sub h. That guy lives inside h. And then this would be some, okay, so before I actually continue, let's uh, get a better understanding of this part at least. The point is that unipotent group, uh, you have a log defined for it. And a log is a polynomial map. So it goes to the Lie algebra. So this is, in fact, ring of polynomials So in the dimension of u variables. Okay, So log, again, u consists of unipotent elements. And you can take the log. And log would be a polynomial map. So that would give, give, give you, a, uh, as a variety, homomorphism between u and its Lie algebra. So so the ring of regular functions is actually a ring of polynomials. So I can talk about GCD of these polynomials. So I, I take the GCD out. So let, that's why actually I put these tildes here. Because, so let P naught be the GCD of P1 tilde, PM tilde. And let PI be <coughs> PI tilde divided by the GCD. So this is just P naught times sum of uh, PI tensor FI. Again, what does that mean? This means that this is going to be P naught of pi 
pi of gamma. This guy lives inside H, so pi just kills it. Sum over, OK, so then pi of, again, pi of gamma. <coughs> then fi of the section comes into the picture now. And then you get uh, gamma times okay, section of pi of gamma inverse times gamma times gamma sub h. So this means if I fix my base point, I get a linear combination of shifts of fi's. Okay, let me again write down what I just said. Have this picture in mind that I am viewing my G as a base of U, and then I have fibers. Each fiber is a shift of H. Okay. The plan is to find lots of good base points in pi of gamma. And then for every good base point, I need to find lots of good points on the fiber. So that's the plan. And how to do it is uh, through this equation. Again, f of gamma, gamma sub h is this guy times. And instead of writing it like that, I'm going to write it like this. The left translate of this guy, so using the inverse of that. Um, of this linear combination. The left translate applied to gamma sub h. Okay, so now we are getting uh, too technical. So let me write down the statements that we need to prove the result. So we need a stronger result for unipotent guy. So here is a theorem for unipotent. Again, this is due to myself and Sarnak. So it says that if I start with, a, let's say, delta, a finitely generated subgroup of a unipotent group, and it's not enough to deal with a single regular function. We need to deal with a bunch of them at the same time. So these are the guys. So these PIs and these PNA. So PNA definitely should not have lots of prime factors. PIs are co-prime, and then the value of PIs should be almost co-prime. Okay, so these are the things that we demand. So let's write it down. So for for given this, for every P naught and P1, PM in the regular functions of u, assuming that GCD of p1 dot dot, dot pm is 1, we can show that there exists r and q0 such that the set of elements inside delta, where, first of all, p0 gamma has at most um, r z 1 over q0 prime factors. So far, it's the same as the previous picture, prime factors. But we need this extra condition that uh, here we knew the polynomials were co-prime. Now we demand that the values would be co-prime. So the values at gamma are co-prime in, in this ring. And the theorem is that this is a risky dance in you. This is not very, it's just a careful induction using Maltzab theory of unipotent groups and uh, Brun's <laughs> combinatorial C.
And then we need a stronger result in, in the case we, where we do have a spectral gap, meaning in the perfect case. So here we have lambda subgroup of H, uh, finitely generated. H is connected and perfect. As you can see here, we, we, we should work with finitely many uh, regular functions at the same time. So we take finitely many regular functions. The only thing that we do need to assume is that they are linearly independent over Q. So under this assumption, we can find R and Q naught where they work simultaneously for all the linear combinations and shifts of these guys. Okay. OK, not all the linear combinations. Linear combinations with where the coefficients have the GCD of the coefficients is 1. Okay. Otherwise, you, I mean, you cannot expect more than that. So then there exists R and Q0 such that they work simultaneously for all the shifts of linear combinations of these guys. where this is a primitive work. So, so GCD of C1 dot, dot, dot uh, CM is 1 in this. And uh, what is this G? G belongs to with denominator at most Q0. Okay, so no matter what G is, no matter what, uh, OK, again. So th then it's clear that you can combine these two to get the needed result. And uh, yeah, so I don't have time to, to go to the proof of uh, Burgen, Sambur, uh, Gambert, uh, Sarnak, and show you how a spectral gap actually gives you the result. Okay, I should stop here.